I've been playing Shining Force, the Sword of Haja? Yeah? Is it bearded? I don't know. Never actually heard it said out loud, so I'm not sure. Or Shining Force Gaiden 2. Or Shining Force CD Book 2. Because you have no time to game. <laughs> Welcome to the next Shining Retrospective. This time we're digging into Shining Force, the Sword of Pierre, also known as Gaiden 2 Jashin no Mesume, or CD Book 2. It originally released on the Game Gear in Japan on June 25th, 1993, following the next year in North America, but PAL wouldn't get, get it until CD dropped in 95 on the Sega Mega CD. The CD version is the one that I played for this review, and it took me roughly 16 hours to complete. And it's made once again by Sonic Software Planning, later known as Camelot. This is a direct continuation of the first Gaiden, taking place about two months later. And honestly, I feel while being very similar to Gaiden 1, it's actually a better game in most areas, around the story, and even some of the gameplay elements, mostly the maps. So, from a gameplay perspective, there isn't much to talk about. As I'm using the CD version, it's the same as Gaiden 1, so you have to check out the retrospective for that one if you want a little more detail. But there is a fun note about the US Game Gear version, that they adjusted the damage and area effect of Freeze and Blaze 3, making them hit a wider area and do like double the damage, making mages absolutely nuts in that version. But, on the other side, the enemies also had the same ability, so they're kind of mental as well. While it wasn't a massive alteration in terms of updated gameplay, they did bring a couple of new features that make this more of an individual title. This being, firstly, you get a section in the middle of where the party split, and you get a couple of maps with each group before moving over to the other team for a couple more until they eventually meet again. This was an interesting way of bringing in and getting some use out of new characters that had just joined the force, and was a fun element from a story perspective as well, the two teams facing different challenges and adversities. There was also a dark map where you had a limited viewing area, and enemies would pop out of the darkness. This map, if you're unprepared, can be a little daunting, but well, if you're leveled, it should all be good. Uh, another fun map is one that actually changes as you go around it, as the landmass sinks into the floor, like into the lava, meaning the map layout actually changes as you go. Again, if you're not prepared, it can catch you unaware. And we get a classic laser beam map. <laughs> so it's got a bit more variety in it than Gaiden 1 had. So overall, it's an increment in progression of inches as opposed to miles and honestly I didn't mind that. Overall the mix of maps and the actual quality of the maps puts it above Gaiden 1 and actually map design is a key feature of this game. Before going into this game and making this review I previously played Shining Force 1, 2 and 3 part 1 but I'd never played the Gaiden games and while having that previous experience going into these games I also expect to see those maps. The ones that are super terrain heavy and take forever. But surprisingly, while there are a couple of maps with a lot of terrain, the way they're designed, it isn't actually too bad. Possibly putting Sword of Hazard near the top of the Shining Force games that I played in map design. Following the previous guiding game, the Sword of Hazard opens up with some mysterious, obvious bad guys doing bad things. Such as, you know, sacrificing a king to the Dark Guardian and plotting against the now allied nations of Guardiana and Cyprus. And all they need to complete their evil plan is the sword. In Cyprus, Nick, still the prince and not king, leads his army out to deal with Ion, leaving Mayfair in charge. But on the way out, they meet some of the new cast that find an injured young man 
taking him to get some treatment in the castle. In the following days, the young man has awoken. Diana is his name, and he has now joined the guards under Mayfair. But it's not long until the forces of Ion assault the castle, and these young soldiers are thrust into battle to protect the castle. Our force consists of Diana, Dawn, and Eric the Night Centaurs, Yaha the Warrior, Natasha the Mage, Luke the Monk. And as with all Shining Force, the first map is a pretty good to grind. A couple of levels out for you guys. The map itself is a simple affair, with a nice open field with enemies on both sides, and just some goblins and scavengers, with a single dragon newt being the most dangerous foe. But yeah, it's a simple battle, just smash them and be done with it. After the battle, Mayfair runs out shouting, the sword of ha sort of Haja oh, it's just this word this word how is it pronounced? Haja has been stolen by someone called Graham, who who is now fleeing and sets some foes for Honest. So straight into second battle. This has us with the same team, and again it's quite simple. It just has two little choke points in the form of bridges and introduces the giant bats and the dwarf. The bats can be annoying as they're as any Shining Force officiado knows, because of their ability to induce sleep. But other than that, smash the enemies once more. Mayfair informs us after we have lost the thief, so we head to the nearby town of Thames. After finding it barren, apart from a merchant, we eventually bump into the priest, that at first refuses to tell us anything, as the town folks are being held captive by Ion forces. But with a little persuasion, we get Slade, the priest, to join us, and we go to the Albert Cliffs after the feast, after the feast and the Sword of Hazur. But of course, en route, a force led by an Ion Knight slows us down. In the most interesting map yet, as as two routes to get to the Knight, a more direct but natural bottleneck, made worse by the wood slowing us down on either side, or a slightly longer route round the outside. I used this map to level up Slade, as he was a bit behind everyone. And then my strategy was simple. Knights with the healer along on the long route, and everyone else up the middle. But beware, the new enemy unit, the knight, he hits a little harder, and has a damn spell buffing a bunch of units, defence and quickness. At the Albert Cliffs, we see Graham once more in the distance, and once again an army of Ion is set on us. This map is a little longer due to the nature of being on cliffs. You have to slowly work your way around... But to complete the map, you just need to kill the new enemy, the Death Archer. But I do recommend killing everyone, as some of them drop fancy items. So make sure you kill everyone, and everyone has at least one item slot ready to pick up the item. At the top of the mountain, we find a small hut. And finally, Grain shows us his true colours. He's actually a good guy. Who would have thought it? He just stole the, sword, stole the sword to get the villagers free from the Dark Mage in charge. But the mage double-crosses him, beating him up and plans to kill Graham and the villagers until we show up. Anyway, this map is a simple pitch battle with a little forest in the middle in the map. But there is a couple of things to take note of. as There is the succubus hiding in the top left, which can be a nuisance, uh, which can be a nuisance due to flying and having magic. The upgraded scavenger, the rat man, looks intimidating and red, but he's actually pretty weak. And don't forget to open the chest. And it's very important to send someone to the well next to the hut to get the museum ticket. This is a CD only thing to do. This does nothing in this game, but it's important for Shining Force CD overall. Once the Dark Mage is defeated, he teleports away and summons a gargoyle to fly off with the sword, while our team flap around being useless, but Graham runs out and shoots down the gargoyle as the Dark Mage explodes. Graham joins the force. Yay, a centaur archer. We head off to the kingdom of Emild, and it's, it looks like the gargoyle crashed down near its castle. This ends chapter one. The first thing I did after the next little bit of story was aggress back and use a bunch of power-up items, mostly on Diana. He got the power wine, protect milk, quick chicken, because honestly, he was feeling lacking compared to everyone else. Getting hit harder and doing less damage, so hopefully this will catch him up a bit. Yaha got the cheerful bread, as his health is a little low. Chapter 2 starts with the force arriving near Emerald Castle, but they can't see any signs of the gargoyles, but a ruckus is taking place at the castle. A small fight breaks out, 
and the drawbridge is broken, I think. <laughs> and it turns out that the guard is actually an iron monster, and so they attack. They have a new body for the battle in the form of Graham. So it's worth letting him get the kills on the map to get him up to speed. The map itself is pretty simple, with a slightly annoying start point as you're sandwiched in between mountains and trees. But once you get out, you just take out the, the two groups of Ratman and Dark Mages. Try not to aggro both at the same time. The map does introduce the upgraded bat, the Ratfly, and the upgraded dwarf, the Hell Soldier, who acts as the boss. On defeating the Iron Forces, the Archer drops the drawbridge and find out that you are the Cypress Army takes you to see the king who has the sword of Hire, or Hazia. Meeting King Emerald, he draws the sword. Meeting the King Emerald, he draws the sword and asks you to come and reclaim it. But as Diana walks forward, a boulder drops and the king's face distorts. It was all an Iomian Iom Iom ruse, as the king has already been sacrificed and replaced with the first of the big bads, Gordon, aka Crazy Eyes, aka Gord of Iom. He releases a wave of magic, devastating the castle, and then flees with the sword. The archer, being slightly miffed at the whole situation, joins the force. So now we have the archer called Chester. Well, this is a simple battle, but the only thing of note being we have the upgraded death archer, the hell sniper. And you may want to let Chester get some kills to help him level. But anyway, just to we're about to follow Gordon into a tunnel, a cat person runs it up to us. She is May, the court mage, and has come to save the king. A little too late. On learning about King Emil's death, she joins us and offers to lead us through the tunnel that Gordon has run into, as it's a bit maze-like. It's not long before we find Gordon and the next map of battle begins. Don't go into this unprepared, as it's a mini-boss map, and you know there'll be tricks up their sleeve. The map is an underground tunnel space, so space is limited, and while the enemies on display aren't tough, the Hell Snipers can pack a punch. But interestingly, we see a new enemy type here in the form of the priest who fle flees back with Gordon. And after fighting through everything, the sneaky buggers summon yet another new type of enemy, the zombie, who, while being resistant to free spells, can also inflict poison. But anyway, defeat Gordon while making sure to level up the new cat girl mage may a little bit. Creepy Gordon falls and drops the sword of Hazard. Yes, finally victory. We've got the sword. Mayfair says that we should return to Cyprus, but a mysterious voice tells us that the battle isn't over. The Cyprus expedition has been defeated and Nick is now held prisoner. So we have to head to Portobello and sail to Iom to, to confirm the truth of the matter. So off we go. Arriving at Portobello, we find an Iom Force standing guard. Surprised to see us since it means we defeated Gordon. Anyway, this map is a little more difficult but a little more difficult compared to what has come before due to all the new units. We have skeletons that hit quite hard, Pegasus Knights, which are flying centaurs, the Brass Loader, a kind of ranged unit, and the Master Mage, the boss, who has the Blaze 3 spell. But after killing all these, we get a nice new weapon for Diana, the Steel Sword, a new arrow type, along with a quick ring in a chest. Once the Master Mage is defeated, he clarifies that Nick has been captured and taken to the impenetrable fortress called Algram. It's around this point your dudes might be around level 10, which is promotion territory. My advice though is hold off a little bit as you for your fighters, wait until around 15, and for the mages definitely wait until 20 to get most of their spells. The extra stat points as well will be worth it. The force heads to the docks to steal Ion's boat. The battle at the, Ar the battle at the harbour can be a little intense as you're funneled into a specific route and the enemies are grouped together a bit more than previously. The worst group has a master mage, so make sure that you use a checkerboard formation. Basically, no one stood side by side. The boss of the map is the Arc Knight, an upgraded Ion Knight. Also, don't forget to grab the battle axe and the running pimento from the chests. The axe is for Yaha and gives him a nice attack boost. Save the pimento for now. After winning the fight, we take the boat, but Mayfair feels something is off, and it's at this point that the survivors from the Cypress Expedition Force appear in the form of Randolph and Sarah. They say Claude has escaped after their defeat with them. Randolph tells us 
to get off the boat, but as the force do, the ramp drops and the boat sets sail, splitting the force in two, with half the force on the boat and half the force still on land. This ends chapter two. Deanna is on the boat group, who are trying to figure out how to stop it. When I say figure it out, I mean panicking. But well, it's not long before a bishop jumps out to inform us that they're falling into a trap. Mwahaha! And battle starts. Just note, you probably noticed at this point that two people have egress. Diana, which is the normal for the protagonist, but Natasha has it as well. The split is the reason why, so each team can have a way to egress out of battle. So this is the perfect opportunity to do some grinding and get those sweet, sweet promotions for everyone on the team. Bar Diana and May. Due to level 15 XP being like 1 XP per member and not having a healing spell like Slade who you can use to bump himself up to 20 easily. We want those to be at level 20 for magic reasons basically. Get all of the others up to level 15 apart from anyone with magic and then laugh, especially as Yaha batters everyone now. The fight itself is super simple as it's designed to ease you into having a smaller team but it does introduce the evil pixie which is a fire flying fire slinging nuisance and the boss man being the newly introduced bishop a better healer for the enemy after the fight claude comes flying in informing us that the others are safe and en route to ion and that we are heading in the right direction straight for the port to demis after landing the group rushed towards the fort but away laid by an ion force led by a sorcerer the battle is one of the most difficult as the enemy can hit hard and if you haven't put the effort into promote you might take a beating but this map is a big field littered with craters and some bow riders worm and lizard men are making an appearance the bow rider in particular packs a punch and seems to hate slade <laughs> after defeating the sorcerer he goes kaboom while being surrounded sending everyone tumbling down a hole but quick cut to the other group the other team led by natasha has already got to the lands of Ion, and Randolph has taken extreme measures, climbed up a cliff, to quickly get into position to help the Anna group from falling to the same force and tricks that Nick was defeated by. The battle is quite a simple one, but useful if you want to promote some of your dudes. Remember, 15 is good for fighters, but wait, for, wait until 20 for magic users. We don't have anything new here, except the map itself being vertical in a sense. We have to use vines to traverse up and down, also, don't forget to grab the chest at the bottom. As we get to the top of the cliffs, we find a village full of workers that built the fortress. A gladiator runs out and explains that the iron forces intend to kill them to keep the fortress's weakness safe. So after finding out that you guys are there to stop iron, he joins off and we have a new pal called Rond. Rond shows us where to repel onto the top of the fortress, but on arriving, some iron forces walk out having a chat about how King wanderer has been sacrificing people to ion and he's going to sacrifice nick next sarah shouts out and alerts the enemies so a fight ensues the fight has nothing special going on apart from renewing evil pixies when you kill one so go down and mop up this rabble killing the boss man sorcerer to finish the battle the sorcerer let it be known that the fortress leader is solo so heading in to find him we walk into a trap a force using some of this power has made it so that we were blinded whereas they can see us so it begins an interesting battle the fights take place in the dark and what that means is originally you can only see three enemies on the map but as you move around enemies pop up so take it steady and make sure not to get too overwhelmed other than that make sure to find the two chests that contain a demon rod and protect ring and kill off the new enemy an upgraded skeleton called the deadly born to finish the map after the fight sarah exclaims that it was a tough battle was it and sets the force towards algon fields cut back to diana's group they're still underground in the middle of a damn lava lake trying to find their way to the fields but uh, well the force come face to face with a foe in an awful terrain being led by a hawkman the battle isn't quite as straightforward as it seems because as you progress lava consumes some of the areas Challenge your group, challenge you into groups of enemies. But other than that, make sure to kill the bishop as he drops a protect staff. Killing the hawkman ends the battle. Diana and Mayfair are concerned as it seems to be a dead end and iron forces are closing in. But suddenly a hole opens in the roof and a mysterious voice drops down a rope. 
Climbing, the two forces reunite once more. And for the first time in this game, you have to make a decision on who you're going to bring. Me, I dropped Dawn for Randolph. Kept the new addition of Sarah. Because another healer is always good. And left Ronda on the bench. Because Yaha was stronger for me. On the field, the Iron Forces start to panic when they realise they can't ambush us. So a possibly longer than normal battle starts. This map is a little annoying due to a, a lot of bottlenecks and slow movement due to the train. It's not the most egregious version of this type of the map, but it still is a little frustrating. It also suffers a bit of a dip in the middle of the field as the enemies are kind of bunched at the bottom of the top. And other than that, it does introduce two new enemies. The Cleric, a bigger healer, and the Ghoul, an upgraded zombie. The Ghoul legs it after the map after the matter, shouting about something called Balan, or Balloon, or something. Well, it wasn't someone, but something called Balloon, the Death Balloon, an interesting enemy for the next map. Arriving at Algon Fortress, the big bads, Solo and Barbara, are having a bit of a tiff, until King Warder puts a stop to it and commands Solo to stop the Cypress army. The map is a straight rush up the castle to kill the boss. There are plenty of chests to collect and a sneaky ninja called Higgins hiding in two spots around the castle. If you find him, you get him to join the force. Other than that, we see the Cerberus for the first time and it's overall quite a simple fight apart from getting hit by Bolt 2 a couple of times. Anyway, Solo upon seeing Diana says he knows who the traitor of Iom is and seems to send Diana into a bit of an odd mood with Mayfair question if he knows who it is. Anyway, this is the end of chapter 3, with chapter 4 opening on the Cypress Force chasing Hindle and, and Barbara, who are dragging Nick with them. Hindle offers a simple plan for Barbara to hold up the Force, while he takes Nick to the shrine, but she doesn't trust him, nor does the King of Iron. Um, it seems Barb has orders to kill Hindle if he acts odd. Diana is also still a little zoned out. But anyway, the force must fight the delaying force of Ion. The battle starts, and it's one of those. The map is kind of awkwardly long due to the placement of enemies and really needing to split your force into two and it's rough terrain. It's not the worst version of this sort of map, but expect it to last a while. But new to this map is the Belial and its little bro, the Gargoyle, new flying type enemies. The Golem then pops out the ground and can be frustrating if you're not as overpowered as my guys were due to the high defence and the boss Minotaur can hit quite hard. After crushing the Minotaurs, the group is about ready to run after Nick when Gian comes out, comes running out of the village and convinces everyone to take a small break as Iam is taking the main road to the shrine, while he knows a shortcut to catch them. The force arrives at a pass that looks dangerous if ambushed, and if a willing it into existence was a thing, that is what happens. This fight is a classic in Shining Force terms, other than introducing the Brass Gunner and the Demon Master, what it has is a long open strip down the middle for an enemy statue with a massive laser beam to fire down, hitting everything friend or foe in its patch. Rush up the middle and kill it ASAP. After the battle, the enemy mentioned something about a resurrection. But a resurrection of what? We arrive at the shrine just as it rumbles because Iom is hungry for Nick's blood. King Warderer leads Nick and Hindle in the shrine, leaving Barbara to deal with the Cypress army. The battle introduces a number of new enemies, none of them fun. First is the Dullahan, a hard-hitting knight-type thingy, a Chimera, a new flappy enemy, and the bloody Taros that occasionally hits with D-Soul, which it did on its first attack, killing poor Graham for me. And then there is Barbara, armed with an axe of Axelus and that can cast Blaze 3. But before fighting any, of this, the statue straight in front of the force hides a new member, Rush the Samurai. Anyway, kill Barbara to win the battle, and the force are about to rush into the shrine where Ion, when an Ion flanking force appears, God, Rush from Guardiana turns up and starts slapping them about, so the force can enter the shrine. And to the, entering the shrine brings an unexpected enemy. It appears that Waldol has been resurrected from the first game, guiding game. And is now sort of some undead creature and is out for revenge. To get his revenge, he brings along assassins, wyverns, and an evil bishop, along with creatures that we've seen before. But in all honesty, this map is pretty simple. No tricks, just a straight up fight. After the fight, Wardle melts. Such is the fate of evil creatures. 
Walking into the room, we find Hindle has betrayed Wardera, and Hindle is now injured. Wardera is about to sacrifice Nick, but decides to fight us first. Again, this is a straight fight, apart from a chest hidden in the top corner containing the white ring. But damn, they ramped up the enemies. With the Dullahan becoming Skull Knight, Minotaur upgrades to Executioner, and a few other hard-hitting enemies, with Wardera himself having Bolt 3. It's a bit of a slog. Defeating Wardera, he teleports over to Nick and attempts to sacrifice him, but Hindle stops him again and it's revealed that Nick and Hindle have been working together because shock, Deanna is Hindle's brother. But in classic Shining Force style, everyone stands around going, oh no. As in revenge for his betrayal, Wardra sacrifices Hindle and himself while the others watch and Ion rises. This battle is intense. We have two little minion type creatures of Ion that regenerate after you kill them. And Ion itself can only be hurt once Nick has used the sword of Hadja to hurt it and both him and the little worm dudes use demon breath um i am also has bolt three and it hits hard to make sure that you have healers ready and kill the bishops asap as he has another healing rain after a while i am drops and water gets dragged to hades by i am and then the shrine starts to collapse diana is panicking hoping to find his brother but nick and natasha talk sense to him and they leave when i am finally being defeated back in cyprus after a long talk with nick Deanna decides to leave, and a cute little scene, Natasha goes with him. Maybe one day they'll return to Cyprus, but who knows. That's the end of um, book two. It really is quite an interesting game in a lot of senses. Like I said at the start, it doesn't really offer anything new much in terms of gameplay, but some of the, the ways they play with the maps while not new mechanics make it a bit more interesting and the map design itself is pretty good overall um with like it's like i said it had a couple of the awkward maps but they weren't as bad as in previous games or in future games so yeah book two isn't a progressive game but it is a very solid good game Story's pretty good, as as you expect for a Shining Force. I mean, Shining Force games aren't known for their big political dramas. They're just classic good versus evil, and it does that well. Adds a few twists and turns, and yeah, overall, it's a really enjoyable game. And up there in terms of the Shining Force titles overall, which is saying a lot. Well, I feel, like personally, I feel every Shining Force is up there, but this is up there, up there. <laughs> so yeah that's my final thoughts overall and um, this is a must play shining force title so my rating for this game is must play